No, no, she's a girl. to her grand. If folks are, uh, you've finished your lunch and ready to, to dig into the really good and nutritious part of the day, and that's a conversation <laughs> with Peter Lawhorn. Um, Peter, as you know, is CEO of the Hilton Foundation, Conrad Hilton Foundation um, in, in Southern California. We were just talking about Los Angeles as we walked in. Um, and he's had about 25 years experience working in the nonprofit and charitable sector, uh, mostly devoted to vulnerable children um, and uh, advancing their well-being. Um, he started out in the Peace Corps. Is that where you started or you? Yeah, yeah, I think that's you know, fair to say. Started out in the Peace Corps, and in fact, something of interest to all of us is that he was in the Peace Corps with Chris Stevens, the former ambassador to Libya who was sadly killed. Um, and they were friends back then, and I might ask him a question about Chris. Um, he was, when we first met, he was the, uh, the CEO of the Firelight Foundation, which is a foundation that identifies uh, and makes grants to um, individuals mostly in 
Is it entirely in Africa? That's right. I think it's entirely in Africa. Right. Um, and again, it's about serving children and, and families. Um, he went on to the Bernard Van Leer Foundation in the, in the Netherlands. <laughs> that foundation is, okay. He went on to the Netherlands to the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. Um, and it too is focused on uh, the plight of, of uh, disadvantaged, disadvantaged children. And he began his career uh, at Save the Children. Uh, and there's, in his 11 years there, eight of them were spent in Mali uh, working on the ground before we were able to lure him back to the, to the States and have him be part of, of our charitable sector uh, here, bringing all that he, that he brings to it. Um, at the Hilton Foundation, he has focused um, the, the grant making on seven programmatic areas, and so we'll, we'll uh, try to get the most out of him about those, about those seven areas. But I, I actually wanted to focus on how you do it, uh, not, not, not on the substance of what you're doing, but the way in which you do it. And I raise this because um, right now we're, we're meeting in a moment of extraordinary polarization in our society. You feel it every day. Um, and sometimes we at the Aspen Institute worry that we're forfeiting our ability to, as mm -hmm. a society to solve hard problems together. You're in the problem solving business. That's what foundations do, <laughs> right? And, and those they support do. I wondered how you go about <clears throat> not only addressing a discrete problem, but building community in the process, building social capital in the process. So you're building our capacity to solve beyond that. That, uh, that discrete problem. Great, thanks Jane. And, and uh, first of all, just really happy to be here. It's uh, wonderful to see all of you. Always a treat to be interviewed by Jane. Uh, and uh, we are a, a funder of Aspen for the Opportunity Youth work, something we're uh, quite proud of. We'll come back to that, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and as, as Jane says, I, 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 I am deeply grateful uh, to you all for the Chris Stevens initiative. Um, so, let me not take on the whole country as a whole. <laughs> we, we may have a conversation about that later and what foundations and organizations like Aspen can do to, to build bridges and uh, narrow divides. But let me start in my own backyard of, uh, of Los Angeles and uh, on a, an issue that predates my being with the Hilton Foundation by about, I think we've been working on homelessness for 20 years, 15 of those years in Los Angeles. It, is a, a very divisive, well, a very present political issue in, in Los Angeles and has been for, for quite a while. 10 years ago, we had the, a, a local version of what we see in national politics now in terms of a city and a county government who are not speaking to one another while the city builds the housing and the county provides the services. So there's no way to, to, to serve the chronically homeless without those two big players working together. And, and there was fragmentation all around. Uh, we were putting between five and $10 million a year into building units of supporting, supportive housing, that is housing with services for the chronically homeless. And we said, wait a second, we, we can do this retail and buy a dollar of good with each dollar of our money and do a certain chunk of good, but it would be much better for us try to, to try to make the whole system work together. So along with the United Way and the Chamber of Commerce, we put together something called the Home for Good Funders Collaborative, which eventually took in basically the entire philanthropic sector in Los Angeles, uh, a, a large number of nonprofits, and then more and more the, the policymakers who, uh, who would eventually have uh, the opportunity to fund on a big scale. Uh, and my predecessor, Steve Hilton, in what was called the hug that was heard around the world, said to the, the Board of Supervisors and the, and the previous mayor, you need to work together. We need you to do this together. And, and I, I, he's, he's a persuasive man uh, and, and a very humble man as well. But I, it was the start of a collaboration that today is thriving. We, uh, we and others said the, the way to deal with homelessness is, is not to get people sobered up first, not to, uh, not to have temporary shelters, but to have long-term housing that is associated with addiction services, uh, with job training, and, and other services that the homeless need. And as of the November 2016 election, which many of you may remember, um, we, uh, the, the citizens of the city of LA voted a $1.2 billion bond with a 75% margin 
over 10 years for the construction of housing. And the, the citizens of the county voted a quarter cent sales tax six months later, which amounts to $350 million a year. So now there is $500 million a year, every year, for 10 years on the table, which is enough to build the housing to, 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 to house the chronically homeless. And for me, it, it's a textbook case, and they, they often do not work out so well, of, of saying how can we leverage the money that we're able to put in, and how can we help build the relationships that will make this really work. That's the, the play is in two acts. That's the first act, and we, we feel fairly good about the first act. The second act is going to be actually harder, because in that first act, we only needed to know 100 people in a county of 10 million. The policymakers, the, the people who are advising the Board of Supervisors and the City Council. Now, we need to be communicating with 100,000 people, at least, in terms of uh, everyone who voted for that bond issue. We're doing it out of half generosity and half impatience. But nobody said, and by the way, please build that housing in my district or my neighborhood. Um, and so now, uh, we are confronted with a, a question of NIMBYism and how to, how to tackle that. And that is an all, all hands on deck sort of question. It's a, something that a foundation itself is uh, um, not as well uh, set up as, as, as the Aspen Institute to do because our communications tools are fairly limited. Uh, but we, we try to work with everyone we think can, uh, can vehicle that message. And it really is a question now of of broadcast communications and of community organizing. So, you know, we're, we're in act two, I'm, I'm hopeful, but we've got our work cut out for us there. But, and I, and I do think that this is a real good example of if you get people focused on needing to solve a problem, you can bridge their divides. Mm -hmm. But understanding where they're coming from, to use a vernacular, let me put it differently, um, there are different incentives and disincentives on a, an elected official. Absolutely. You know, and, and leading to some short-termism. Um, to what degree do you, in your role, need to have a kind of empathy and understanding of the pressures on those people to help them navigate <laughs> and, right, and, and, and do what the, the coalition views as the right thing? You, you have to understand what motivates people. Uh, and particularly the people who have the resources to make the decisions that you, you, you think are the right ways to go. Um, at the same time, you need to be a counselor that says you need to consider other things than, than, than simply the poll numbers on, on this, this issue. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on, or I'm not an expert on homelessness in general. I'm less informed about New York than I am about Los Angeles, but my impression is that New York has gone the shelters route because of it's, it's appeal to, to politicians, essentially, that it, it gets homeless people off the streets. It, makes, uh, it gets uh, the, the, their, their ratings increased. But the city is spending about a billion dollars a year on shelters and does not have the money then to buy, to, to construct the housing that's the longer term solution. So I think you, you have to go to the electeds and say, I, I totally understand why you're doing this. But I know that you understand the long-term issue as well. And you know, we, that bond gives us a 10-year horizon to fix this. It will expire in, in, in 2027, the year before the Olympics. And we want this problem licked by then. Mm. So let's, let's work on both of those things. Mm -hmm. So another area where you're, you're, you've dived into uh, collaborative uh, problem solving is in, in aligning particularly your international goals <coughs> around the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. There's a situation where the folks that carry out the SDGs are national governments. Mm -hmm. so you're not just dealing with one institution. Talk a little bit about what's the hard part of that <laughs> and, and what are the mechanisms you're using for aligning your work to those of, of national strategies as well as global goals. Sure, and, and let me, I'll digress just a little bit about why I believe in these goals and why uh, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter, and, and many of my colleagues are. Jane uh, alluded to my having been in Mali for eight years in the 90s. I arrived just after the, the Declaration of uh, Education for All had been made in Thailand in, in 1990. Every government in the world signed on to the idea that they would get all of their children into school. Um, and the Malian government was spending 25% of its budget on getting 20% of kids into primary school. 
and all of those kids were going to school in cities, and, not, and if you go to a village, you would find nothing. And when you did find a school in a village, there were 20 boys for every girl who was enrolled. And we said, you know, this, how, how is this going to work? But we were very committed to the execution of that goal. And we said, we're, we say the children are working in an area of 200 villages. We're going to figure out a way to make this work. And, and we looked at how you could reduce the cost, uh, both the capital costs and the recurring costs of schooling by about 90% and still have the same level of quality as you would find in the government schools. And we helped 800 communities establish schools, which increased the number of schools in the country by about 40%. And with resources that they already had, both human and financial. So I'm a believer in those goals creating ambition and creating possibility. Uh, and, and I think you know, the world needs that. Those of you who, who saw the IPCC report know we ain't got much time to do stuff that we don't know how to do yet. And we don't have nearly the political will assembled that, that we need on them. So I think without those goal frameworks, people tend to do incremental stuff that goes off in this direction, this direction, and it doesn't add up to a collective. That brings us to philanthropy, which I think during the Millennium Development Goals 15-year period from 2000 to 2015, philanthropy did a lot of stuff. You know? And I think we put in several billions of dollars into uh, especially the goals on education and health around uh, the, the developing world. But we were doing it, by and large, without reference to the, the framework that existed, and often without even collaboration with national governments. You go in and you say, here's a, here's a nonprofit that we like. Let's fund them and see what we can do. And then if it succeeds, then you knock on the government's door and say, hey, guys, would you like to take this on? You know, would you like to be the replicators of this? And that's not the way to, to do something that is sustainable and that is really anchored in the larger funding streams, which are inevitably governmental and perhaps private sector, depending on the country you're talking about. So I think. The foundations are trying to, uh, to approach the sustainable development goals with a lot more foresight and a lot more groundwork. And the role that we've tried to play along with the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation, or sorry, the MasterCard Foundation, is to inform as many foundations as possible about the SDGs. This is what they are. This is what the world is trying to accomplish by 2030. And here are potential roles for foundations within that. And you know, we always say to folks, if you're an endowed foundation, you don't have a business cycle. You don't have an electoral cycle. And you're not fundraising. So you have a home court advantage in terms of medium to long-term planning that governments and businesses and nonprofits do not have. Use it. Don't stick in that three-year planning horizon that is just the default of everybody. And I think that is very helpful to something like the Sustainable Development Goals, because people otherwise tend to approach them incrementally. What can we do this year, next year, the year after that? And inevitably, you get to 40% of what you were trying to do at the outset. But if you start with the end in mind and say, what needs to be fixed? What needs to be amplified in order to get there? I think you have a much better uh, chance. That said, you know, the UN is a high transaction cost mm -hmm. partner, right? It, it, it takes time to figure them out. It takes time to work with them. And you need to also find who has the implementation legs in the countries that you're, you're working in. So it's not, it's not easy, but I think the payoff is high. So we've seen um, examples in country. I'm thinking of Liberia right mm -hmm. now under Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of their actually setting up mechanisms for, number one, aligning external money and their, uh, their ref economic reform agenda, um, but also even setting up a mechanism for to, to manage relations with foundations. I mean, yep. As I remember it, a few foundations went to President Sirleaf and said, we don't want you spending your time talking That's to right. us. That's you know, right. your obligation is to, is to your, your citizens. Um, you know, we'll help fund an office that's in charge that's of right. managing us. Yep. So say something about that. And, and are there similar mechanisms in other countries, and, or do they need them? Yeah, uh, my wife is from Rwanda. So my, my country-in-law is uh, <laughs> very um, adept at this, at this game. And they'll basically say to any funder who comes in, we welcome you. We would like you to work in this district on this issue. You know, because they have, they've got a game plan. And, and typically, 
it's, it's a pretty sophisticated one. And they know where they need help. And also, I think, as in the case of Liberia, they know what obstacles are down the road. You know, if we want to get to uh, getting all of our kids, for example, into secondary school, you know, the, 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 the cost, the business model needs to be changed and the delivery model of it because we don't have the resources to afford that. How can we work on that? And I think that's, that's it's, you know, foundation funding is a drop in the bucket compared to the three to four trillion dollars annually that is the price tag of, of the SDGs if everyone went after them. And we only have value, or real value, I think, if we're acting catalytically. If we're helping people solve bigger problems and aim the bigger fund funding streams that they have uh, in more intelligent ways. You know, and I think that's what the, the group in Liberia has been trying yeah, to do. Yeah. So one of the sustainable development goals is safe water. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you've got a program focused on we water. Do. Say something about that program. You know, we have been working in water in West Africa, mostly in Ghana, for the last 25 years or so. And we've done a lot, uh, both with local organizations, international uh, NGOs, and with the government on drilling wells and boreholes. Uh, we recently came to the conclusion that the, uh, the, the next phase really needs to be on helping this be sustainable and, and well, financially, uh, market-driven and financially affordable. And that's been a whole sea change for us in terms of we had a Johnny Appleseed sort of way of doing this. You know, people would say, well, this community needs a well, great, we'll go out and dig a well. And uh, now we're working with municipalities in Ghana, in Burkina, uh, in Ethiopia, and Uganda, and saying, how can we strengthen you to provide water to everybody? And how can we do it, which this is the revolutionary part from my perspective, uh, w with the idea of piped water on premises, rather than having people trekking for a mile, two miles, five miles to, to get water. And of course, typically girls and women doing that. Uh, and if, if we can bring that off, I think it will be a tremendous boon. And big we, of course, not, not just us. I do have to say, sometimes with my board, it's a struggle because they, they are very attached to, to the building of wells and the counting of wells and boreholes. And tangible, yeah, I, I can understand that. When you tell them, we're about good, governments, good governance in, in West African municipalities, they say, huh? <laughs> and is that smart? You know? <laughs> so we're, we're on a road. Uh, we, we feel that this is the way to go. And we feel greatly supported by the SDG framework. But uh, we, we do need both to think through how the strategy can be done and to say it convincingly to people who um, are really looking for the tangible. Yeah. All right. Um, you said big we, not to be confused mm -hmm. with big league. And, and, <laughs> and so I'm just I'm wondering how many foundations are sort of signed up with you around the SDGs? How many feel that they are advancing at least some of the SDGs? You know, I, 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 uh, the Foundation Center, which tracks all you know, foundation activity and, and grants and stuff, is now um, uh, tracking all foundation grant making according to the SDGs. And in that passive way, they're racking up a whole lot. I think they're, they're, they're expecting something like $60 billion worth of foundation investment in the SDGs, um, I think, to, to to 2030. Uh, however, it is mostly passive. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these foundations don't even realize that they're speaking pros or funding the SDGs. Uh, I think there's a smaller group uh, that will really you know, say this is important to us and the framework is, is something that everyone should know about. Uh, I, I'd, I'd say about 15% of US uh, grant making is done overseas, mm -hmm. and I think about a third of that is Gates, and the other, yeah. the other 10 percent is other foundations. And within that, I think it's a, it's a, it's a smaller minority that is mm -hmm. really saying the framework is important. But we'll continue to encourage, because for me, the leverage is so much higher if you look at yourself as part of a bigger activity than if you're just controlling your own grant stream to your own partners. And it's a huge learning opportunity to learn from one another. Absolutely, right. yeah. absolutely. And I, you know, people ask me about philanthropic partnerships from time to time. I, for me, those are great, 
but greater is biodiverse partnerships that include governments, that include academia, that include organizations like the Aspen Institute, because then you're taking different complementary strengths and putting them together. If you only have foundations together, you've got some strengths together, but you've also got a few weaknesses that bang, multiply each other. Yeah. Um, you have a program that focuses on children affected by HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. and obviously good health is a big part of the SDGs as well. Um, you're, if I understand correctly, in particular, you're looking at social and emotional development or early childhood development mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in this instance. We at Aspen, we have a commission on, yeah. on social and uh, emotional development. Say something about the intervention, the kind of the right timing for intervention. What does it mean to, to intervene in a child's life when they're sort of zero to five, you know, whatever, whatever number you want to pick? Sure. Well, you know, clearly there are two stages where brain development is, is most intensive in humans. One is uh, infancy or conception to the end of age three, where 85% of your, 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 your neurons are already there at the end of age three, and you're learning more per instant in, in, at that age than you are at any other time in life. The second plastic time, of course, is adolescence. Um, which we are also interested in adolescent brain development. Um, you know, if you look at education investment by basically any industrialized country, the, the intensity is just is exactly backward, right? You, the, the, the per dollar cost or, the, the, uh, the, or per capita cost uh, that's put into tertiary education is usually more than 10 times what is put into early childhood. And yet, if there are ways to uh, stimulate early development and protect kids from, from adverse experiences in, in, in young life, it, it has a real payoff. And you've, you've seen that. I think those of you who, who follow the, the World Bank have seen, over the last few months, the, the launch of their Human Capital Index, and that, which has had a bit of controversy attached to it, but is basically a statement that investment in, in, in people is more important in the future of the bank than investment in infrastructure. And Jim Kim will say, you know, I want to uh, I want to go to Davos and I want to see lists of, of, of stunting rates per country because that is future competitiveness of economies, that's national IQ points, that's that's the ability of, of countries to, to solve their own problems. And I'm I'm heartened, you know, I, I as you said at Van Leer, we were all about early childhood. I've been in, in this area for about 20 years, and I've never seen as much concentrated effort on really investing in, in, in this age of life as now. And I believe that we may, may see one of the bilaterals make early childhood the same sort of global public priority that it is in every OECD country domestically. Hmm. Each of us has a head start or a smart start, and none of us has ever had that in our in our global investment, uh, but I, I, I think there's there are there are possibilities there. Mm. You also have a program that focuses on work for, workforce development, and I can't help but think that um, social and emotional development matters there too, right? That, that that early intervention, particularly given the growth of service industries around the world, is that the kind of non cognitive skills That's right. of being able to look somebody in the eye with confidence, of being agile. Um, uh, adaptive, say something about the, the connection between those two. I know you don't have them programmatically linked, but the goals seem to, seem to intersect That's right. in any I, event. Well, I think you, you hit it right on the head. I mean, those, those skills are, are really important. And I think you could say that they're even more important in, in the case of, of opportunity youth, you know, who have a lot of obstacles to get over and manage mm -hmm. in their daily life. Uh, and again, this is a, a, a partnership we're really pleased with, with the Aspen Institute. Uh, we, we funded a, a, a grant with you early on, I think, in, in, uh, in Steve Patrick's time, uh, which was looking at foster youth, transition age foster youth in New York and Los Angeles, and their access to employment and, and higher education. Uh, and really, your, your networks were really helpful to that getting off the ground. And then I uh, also uh, work in New Orleans with you, which I think was the first southern city that the Opportunity Youth uh, uh, Incentive Fund was involved in. Um, and that one is focused on the hospitality industry, which we look at as um, a 
a place where it's easy to get entry, to, to find entry level work, and there, there are plausible career pathways. So a, a good place to look at in terms of workforce development. Uh, we are, we're currently looking at expanding that work and trying to decide whether it's an, uh, only domestic or domestic and international work. So if there are those in the audience that have ideas about that, I would, I would be interested. I should emphasize, you mentioned the hospitality industry, the Hilton Foundation and the, and the Hilton family no longer, no longer own the Hilton, is it called Hilton Worldwide, the business? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there's no, you know, no, no connection between the two anymore. Um, but you certainly have a board that knows what they're talking about when they talk about the hospitality. That's right. Um, you, you mentioned foster kids that are tra transition age. Um, is that 17, 18? What is the... What Depends is the on the state they have to, happen to be living in. The, ah. the trend has been to increase the, uh, the age of transitioning out of foster youth from 18 to 21, which is great because who at 18 is ready to kind of take on their entire life and uh, with all the challenges that foster kids will have. Uh, so that's now the case uh, for the last four or five years in California, and it has made a real difference. Uh, you know, we, we tend to, in, in each of the areas we work in, look for the folks that seem like they have the hardest situation to, to work out. When you look at, at foster youth, older foster youth uh, have the lowest likelihood of being adopted. In fact, it's, it's, it's close to nil. Uh, so they will essentially be, uh, be on their own uh, and need to not only kind of figure out what is, what is my uh, educational path. I, I met uh, a very successful and self-assured uh, uh, foster youth, former foster youth recently, who said she'd been to eight high schools. And I think that's, that's, that's quite typical. The, all the moving around and all the disruption. And beyond that, they have to be fluent in how to deal with all sorts of government services, uh, get the best out of a social worker, figure out how to, um, how to work with their, their own and extended families if they're in the picture. And so all of these coming back to the social and uh, emotional yeah. learning, very, very important. And I think street taught or self-taught, I should say, in a, mm -hmm in a lot of cases. Um, but we, we do see, we see a good improvement in LA and New York on, on opportunities for foster youth, but I would say it's an invisible problem compared to homelessness. You know, you can't drive around downtown LA without, uh, without seeing homelessness. You can't walk downtown without, without encountering it, and more and more in other places in the area. Foster youth, you can walk right by them and not know it. So it's, it's incumbent on, on, on us and others really to try to keep that, that issue in people's attention and, and really work as hard as possible with those who are well disposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to end my interview with you where we began and then turn it over to you all to ask questions and we'll have roving mics so, you can, so we can all hear you well. Um, but back to this fragmentation, mm. um, polarization in our society. In fact, one of the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, number 16, the hardest mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. uh, is, is building um, the institutions um, of, of governance that can, that, that can spell success in the other areas. We seem to be dismantling some of ours or questioning some of ours and dismantling some of our norms. What is this, I, mean, I hope I'm not putting too much opinion into this, but what does this particular environment mean for a foundation that has a well thought out five year strategy that is committed to staying the course, because uh, virtually all these strategies don't mm -hmm. show the returns in one year or two years, it's, it's over, over decades sometimes. Um, do you have to reorient anything you do um, does it, does it mean changing a focus here or there when the context changes that much? And I, you know, you're asking me that question, but I think you could probably be asking everyone in the audience in their, whatever their daily role is about that question. Yeah. Uh, and you hit, again, right on the head. Uh, we try to be strategic. We try to have very focused goals that we think we can deliver on and we know how we would measure it. 
and yet, we find ourselves in situations where you could you know, win the battle and lose the war. I think there are two uh, meta, mega, macro issues, really, that are confronting all of us right now. One is climate, and the other is the state of our democracy. Right? And I, I, I think in boardrooms, of foundations all over the place, we're trying to say, well, how do we still deliver on the commitments that we've made, but free up enough of our bandwidth and, and our resources so that we can make a good citizenship contribution on bringing people together? I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't have the, the definitive answer to that. Here's the magic formula. Uh, if anyone in the audience does, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> and certainly we can discuss in the Q&A what, what might be good approaches. But I think it, uh, it's increasingly evident that foundations are going to have to set aside part of the strategic approach in order to contribute to, uh, I, I think, a couple of the big framework issues. I think that's, that's the reason I, I wanted to ask you about your kind of community building approach. Mm. Because in many ways, it's building community is, is the answer. I think most people here know that David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, has joined us at the Institute to look at that, that question in particular. How do you build community, uh, strengthen the social fabric from the ground up? He has a very good uh, uh, column in the New York Times today uh, about people having local allegiances, or where he calls himself a, a nationalist in a good sense. Um, I only quibble with one line in that, where he's talked about globalists who've had their heart, hearts bleached of loyalty for any particular place. Because I think you can, be, you can be globalist and local at the same time. In fact, we all have to be. Yeah, yeah we all yeah. are. Um, we all have multiple identities. Um, so what we're going to do is open it up to you guys for questions. Just raise your hand. and. Um, Please, can we bring the mic up here? Uh, I'd like to double click on the conversation about the global goals and also thank you because you gave a very small grant to Aim to Flourish that was very catalytic about celebrating the global goals. Great. I'm wondering what you think about um, the lack of traction in America compared to other places, the global goals, the SDGs are, are celebrated and well known when you go to other parts of the world. And um, they're really not very well thought of in, in America. And there was even some, some conversation about creating SDGs that would be sort of America first kind mm -hmm. of global goals. Um, what's, what's wrong with this picture? Why is that? We have the UN you know, here, but can't seem to um, get people to relate to the SDGs. Well, I, I look at the glass as at least a third full on this because, you know, we haven't withdrawn from the SDGs either. You know, so I, I, I think the federal government is currently not very bought in. I, I, but I think we were surprised that the Obama administration went as far in as it did because, you know, it, it's, it's not in the tradition of the U.S. government to well, in, in the last 40 years anyway, to, to really invest in, 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 in global agreements. Uh, I think if you look at the subnational era uh, level, there's a lot going on. The city of New York has done a, a, um, a, a voluntary local review of, of the SDGs and, uh, and all of its operations. Los Angeles is looking at doing the same thing. Uh, and I think you, you, uh, the city of San Jose is always top of the list mostly because of their, their green uh, efforts. So I, you find a lot of stuff municipally. And, and one thing we're trying to do, along with the uh, UN Development Program, is to get cities uh, enrolled as actors in the high-level political forum next year that does the first review of the SDG so that it's not just nation states. Because it, it isn't only in the states where the federal government or the national government is paying less attention. It's also in a number of European countries. You know, and uh, that it's a it's a tougher row, but I, I think there there is activity. Let's go to the other side of the aisle since we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dana Bruce. Good afternoon, Jane and Peter. I work for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, okay. and I felt like I had a timely add-on for that first question. We are in 30 states across the U.S. Everywhere um, from Alabama to Arkansas, and we have these conversations, and it really becomes 
how can leading globally or, or participating globally benefit us locally? And we oftentimes do this through a, a private sector leader in the state or in the area alongside a member of Congress talking about why this is important. Where we often don't have a voice would be the local foundations and the philanthropy leadership. We may have a save, as you're aware of, or mm -hmm. a care, but the, the local philanthropy talking about why it's important for that farmer in Minnesota that we uplift the globe because it emerging markets is where we're headed. So what would be your response to phil philanthropic leadership, not just from the Rockefellers and the Hilton Foundations, but when you come into the community foundations within the states um, that could help lift this message? Well, I think that's, that's the answer right there. Um, oh, by the way, say, say hello to Liz, please. Uh, you know, uh, there are, I think, 50,000 foundations in the US. Uh, and 2,000 of them are staffed. And only a handful are the brand names that people know about. There are hundreds of community foundations in the country that are resolutely local that are trusted, that are both endowed and fundraising. So that gives them a, a real relationship to the, their communities. Um, and I think they are perfect vehicles for discussions about, about all sorts of global policy, from, uh, from SDGs to, to climate. Um, and indeed, the, the Council on Foundations, which is our kind of national association, has had uh, gatherings in Little Rock and in, uh, uh, in Minneapolis about the global goals and what they mean to people. Some of them, it's obvious. Like, you can't solve climate in just one country. You can't work on water in just one country. In the things, the people goals that are more within a, a bounded area, still, if you, if you say you have a concern about immigration, well, the best way to step in immigration is to have an educated uh, citizenry and a stable government in the country of origin. You know, so. I think you can make all sorts of good arguments that will be resonant locally. Uh, and I, I think uh, community foundations would be hungry to do it. Why don't we go, actually, right behind you. Yeah, yeah. and then we'll go over here. Hello, my name is Marla Dean, and I'm with the um, Bright Beginnings. We are a local nonprofit here that runs early childhood and adult learning centers for families experiencing homelessness okay. in a oh. two-generation approach. And so we do social emotional learning, mm -hmm. workforce development, mental health services, all of those things. What I wanted to know is, I was listening to your experience in LA. When are you going to bring some of that expertise to DC to um, coalesce that kind of conversation because it's fragmented. Many people don't understand here in DC, and you talk about foster children. We have 2,700 children in DC under the age of six who are homeless. Yeah. And so I want to know when you're going to come our way and share some of that expertise. Great question, and thank you for the work that you do. It sounds tremendous. Um, you know, in terms of sharing of experience and expertise, our, our staff are very wired in to national coalitions. Our, the, the head of our domestic programs, I think, was the chair of Funders Together to End Homelessness, which I'm sure has a, a DC chapter. And you know, I, I, I think uh, it's really important for us to share experiences, both of successes and of failures. We draw a lot of inspiration from the city of Salt Lake, which made really significant uh, progress in, in, uh, on their homelessness. Uh, I think in LA right now, we really have to deliver, right? I mean, if we, uh, and I'm, again, big we, including all of the electeds, all of the appointeds, the business community, because we've, we've made a pact with, with the community that, that we're, we're gonna end this. Uh, I think there, are, there will be many lessons to draw from that that you can apply right away. Uh, and there will be things where we stumble, where you should pay good attention. Uh, and in terms of uh, available funding, uh, if, if you come up to me later, I'll make sure to put you in touch with our, our staff. You'll, you'll be out of our geographic area, but they know everybody. So, yeah. So let's come down here. Oh, OK, and then down here. Uh, quick question for you. I was curious, um, your opinion on impact investing and, and how that plays a role in solving the SDGs, and then also whether or not the Hilton Foundation 
invest its endowment in a way that's aligned with the philanthropic mission? All right, so I'll give you two answers. Um, you know, I think the, the, if you were a businessman and had launched the SDGs, people would look at you as though you were crazy, right? Because there wasn't an implementation plan and there wasn't a financing plan when the gavel went down. They are values driven and they're very important, but they are not yet financed. So I think, I, I think everyone is kind of scrambling to find the, uh, what are all the ways to pull together the finance for that. And I think impact investing will be part of that. And I think the, pr the private sector will have a large role, again, depending on the country, uh, in, in, in financing the SDGs. Uh, in terms of my own foundation, I have to say we are a fairly conventional foundation that uses its endowment to generate money for its grant making. Um, but that within our grant making, we can use the grant money for anything including impact investments. We've done development impact bonds. Uh, I, I would say that I think right now there is more hype than evidence in, in a lot of impact investing. Our, our experience with the impact bond was a little bit sobering, I think, in that way. So I'm always looking for people who have evidence as well as value-driven arguments for, for, for doing it. There's a, a, another kind of bond that really is like mm -hmm. a bond, and that's the immunization bonds that, yeah. that Gavi yeah. put out. And, and that is a, a, a really interesting story to, to, tell, to understand and to tell. Indeed. Um, so if we could come down here. And then right behind her, right next. Yes, I, uh, I'm really, I'd like to commend you on all the work that you're doing there with all these uh, other groups and foundations. It ain't but me, you, it's my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm wondering about something else because okay. I've had uh, experience in working in India and setting mm -hmm. up programs. Uh, I found that it's very important to have the recipients of all these programs as stakeholders in the whole system. Mm -hmm. That is the magic part of it. If you don't have that, your programs are not sustainable. Indeed. So my question is, at what point or to what degree do the people that are actually receiving this have a stake in this and what responsibilities do they have so that this isn't just an enabling project for mm -hmm. them? Yeah, and uh, you, have you read Winners Take All? Pardon? Have you read Winners Take All? Uh, it's, a, it's a new book uh, that is critical of, uh, of, of philanthropy in general for putting Band-Aids on after they've, uh, you know, stolen from the cookie jar. But, uh, well, you know, I think I would answer your question at two levels, right? Uh, and uh, one level I think uh, foundations can do a good job and another level is harder because the, the money goes at two, two levels. It goes to organizations that provide services to ultimate beneficiaries. I think there is a good feedback loop, uh, or certainly in a, in, a, in a foundation that aspires to, to, uh, to be a good grant maker, there's a good feedback loop with grantees. And we have all sorts of double blind ways of knowing whether they appreciate the way that we work and we understand their issues. Uh, and, and we follow those assiduously, right? And, and, and pay a lot of attention to that. It's harder to know uh, about beneficiaries um, some people don't like that word, but let me use it as, as shorthand, uh, and, and uh, whether the work is what they would have asked for, wanted, et cetera, because often beneficiaries don't know what foundation the money is coming from. They can give you feedback on the grantee. And, and I, I think the, the, there are organizations, Keystone Accountability, uh, others that are trying to work on that, and to, to bring more of the voice of the beneficiary into uh, even, even kind of a Yelp for nonprofits. And so I think we'll see more channels for feedback than there have been. But that's, that's the challenge right now, I think. In, and particularly, as you say, when you're working in a country that's not your own and where you're not really an, a, 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 a local, well, either a local or part of the local political process. So the, uh, Gordon Conway, who was mm -hmm. the president of Rockefeller Foundation, what, 15 years yeah. ago? It's been, yeah. been a while. <clears throat> Used to, I mean, he was sort of the champion of public-private partnerships. And he would always say, you need the beneficiary at the table during the design phase. Yeah. So from, from the get-go. So, yes, sir. We're gonna... All right. 
Hi. Hi. I'm from Baltimore at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, and, and we work with children with, uh, among other disabilities, uh, with traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And so many of the children that are homeless or that we see in foster care yep. uh, have experiences that are just traumatic, unbelievable, and ongoing. And I wonder how you approach, I mean, that must be a big percentage of the, of the children. And when you're talking about the ultimate transition to employment, uh, one of the, it's a mental health issue, but it's more than mental health. It's a neurologic uh, reaction to being exposed to ongoing stress, severe stress. I wonder how you approach, uh, how that's packaged in with your goals for the, the, this population. And it's a challenge because, you know, as Jane said, we, we, we know these things to be true about early childhood, and yet we have chosen for good reasons to be working with an older population uh, that, that most other funders don't work with. But you realize that if there is early intervention, it will make a big difference in the yes. lives of the population you're trying to serve. And that's exactly the same situation we run into with ministries of education and health in the developing world, where if the Ministry of Health really works on nutrition in the first year of life, it will have a big payoff to the Ministry of Education, and yet they often don't try to yes. coordinate on that. Um, so I, 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 in the way that we've set up our program, I don't think we have an ideal answer to that. But I, I do think that uh, what, we, what we can do is work closely with those who are working with the, with the youngest age and, and make sure that there are, there are services, there are protections, there is good awareness about, about the importance of, uh, of intervention at that age. And I think you know, in, in LA there, and in New York, there are plenty of people who are working at that age group, but you know, communication really helps. I think. You know, at the government level, mental health is often seen as, is, is administered mm -hmm. separately from physical health, yes. yep. and, and yet, yeah. The, it, it shouldn't be. Well, and the, sometimes the foundation can help on that. I mean, the, the way that we sold supportive housing to the county of Los Angeles was to say that, you know, you're going you're gonna to pay more in ER visits from a, a chronic homeless person in a year than you would to construct housing for them. You know, and so it makes financial sense for you to look across your, your, your different silos and, and, and bring this together. Um, but it, it, it's an uphill battle. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for being here. I just sure. wanted to ask a question to, to pick up on uh, the comment about evidence, and it's also connected with impact investing, and it's mm -hmm. the I, it's it's the uh, it's the role of data. Yeah. And I wanted to get get your sense of uh, how your foundation looks at data, how it looks at evidence, you know, what constitutes evidence. There's a there's a, the Kellogg Foundation put out a logic model a while ago to look at the difference between. Uh, uh, outcomes and impacts, mm -hmm. you know, and that line is a little fuzzy. So I just want to get your sense of what, again, what constitutes evidence from your perspective looking at data? I think we set the threshold a little lower than some other foundations. Uh, and I think that's a conscious choice. Uh, you know, when, when our, we looked over our values as an organization, uh, thinking big was there, but so was compassion. You know, and a lot of our work is, uh, is compassion driven. That said, you know, we, we, we want to see the effectiveness of the programs that we're investing in. Uh, but I, if you took a, a, a continuum of, from on this side, responsive funders to directive here, and the directive ones tend to be the ones who say, these are the outputs we want to see, here's how you should get there and basically turn their grantees into contractors. We, we try to be more in the middle. You know, a, an organization on the responsive end will say, you guys know everything there is to know. We just find the good ones and we, we invest in them and we follow your story. You know, I, I think we would, we would try to do a, in between those two. I think also what you see in the foundation world is increasing number of foundations that, that see part of their job as advancing learning in the field. And so what they like to do is take the data they and their grantees generate and get it out there so that other people don't mm. have to make the same mistakes and could start where they left off. So that's, you're seeing that ethic uh, emerge within the philanthropic totally. world. Um, here, oh, we need a mic over here and then we'll go back there. Thank you so much, Peter. and. Jane for, um, for
providing such a great overview of what, Hil what the Hilton Foundation does and um, sharing also your, your story and insights on um, what, what you've done. It's a great, really great work and a lot, lots and lots of impact already had, had been done, positive impact on the world. Um, I'm with um, You Are Citizen. My name is Elena Key, and we are a local DC-based charity helping people look great, feel great, and be successful through uh, job creation, mm -hmm. education, and um, helping a part of population with transitioning those who leave correctional institutions mm -hmm. and newly immigrants who come to the yep. U.S. and they need help with um, settling in. So um, my question is, how does the F Hilton Foundation allocate resources towards your priority programs, such as workforce development, mm -hmm. youth, um, housing, and other um, important areas? Other. And is, are those numbers um, fixed, or they um, vary from year to year? Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, they do vary from year to year uh, in, in terms of, uh, of how large is our payout in a given year. Uh, and they're pretty much equivalent, uh, the different programs. But we do try to look for opportunities in particular. If we see an opportunity, we, we will overinvest, if you like, in, in that area. Um, yeah. It, but it, it is a, it, it's a challenge because the, the, you know, we work both in Africa and the States. Unit costs are quite different. What, what you can do with the money that you put in is, is different. So, um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. So we have some hands here. Thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation. I appreciate learning about your organization. Um, can we go back to IPCC for the mm -hmm. moment? Because it seems like it's uh, climate change uh, is the one uh, issue that will roll over many of these other issues right. uh, if we don't address it immediately. So uh, the first question is, um, do you have a strategy uh, to try to make an impact in this area? Um, and the second is, um, it seems that we need fast innovation, and how do we focus funds uh, into innovating very fast and trying to cure this problem, or at least provide solutions as quickly as possible? Thank you. Sure. Um, this is a tough one, right? Because, uh, you know, as, as Jane said earlier, uh, we've all got our missions, and we've all uh, signed on for the long haul on those, uh, and yet uh, the evidence is that the time to work on this is more and more now, and last year. Uh, and so I, I, uh, the way this is coming up with our board, which is a kind of, is, uh, is a side issue, but it, it, it really brings it in, is we were, we were building um, a new headquarters that was LEED Platinum Plus Plus. We have one already that is uh, net zero energy, and I think a really exemplary f even within California. But the new building was becoming more and more expensive because of the site we were on, because uh, green is, is expensive to build, uh, and because the way a foundation does it tends to be more expensive than that. <laughs> uh, and we ended up uh, finding that the headquarters of the Dole Corporation was for sale a mile away, three times the square footage, uh, one-third the price. Uh, and we opted to take on that building. And now the question is, how much, do we, how much should we spend on greening it up? Um, which I think ultimately is a much more valuable question to be working on than building one from scratch that is net zero energy. Because something like 37% of, of the greenhouse gases can be traced to buildings. Um, this is, uh, but it's, this is, it's a live debate in, in our board, but it's not a program debate. And what we need to do is move this into the question of programs and say, you know, look, we, our mission is alleviating human suffering, and the biggest cause of human suffering is going to be climate change. 
right? So I, I, I think that we will all move into this in some way. Um, but then deciding what is the best way to participate with the sort of stake that we will have. And again, it's like the SDGs, the price tag is so high that the amount that a foundation can contribute is, is, is minuscule. And how do you do that in a way that allows other money to come in? And in our case, it would be how do you do it in such a way that is going to be about people and not about carbon? You know, or, or not, not abstractly about, uh, uh, because I, I, I know my board. You know, we've got to make those people linkages closely. So I think we will be in the mitigation business more than in the, uh, in the prevention business, most likely. Uh, but it, you're right, it's a, it's a debate that everyone's having. And I imagine it's, that's not just foundations. It's everyone that has a social impact. Yeah, we started. Oh, easily. Yeah, well, that's right, I'd, I'd love to hear. So, so we started this conversation focused on collaborative problem solving as something that the Hilton Foundation very much is at the forefront of it. Of, um, but it's spreading, yeah. it's, not, it's not just Hilton. And collaboration so is spreading. Cal collaboration is spreading. <laughs> and Hewlett and um, Hewlett Foundation and yeah. Packard Foundation have joined forces well, they've joined forces first to create the, uh, the Climate, Climate Foundation, Works, yeah. Climate Works. Um, but they're now doing, uh, raising money for a great big fund. Was it $30 million? How much was it, Ashley? Do you remember? $30 million? Um, so there is an, another way to kind of, for, for philanthropy to, philanthropies to leverage one another um, and to bring in others for, for, for a problem that is way too large for any one or two or five. Although, you know, if, if $30 million were the only price tag, I think you, you, you'd see a lot of foundations bellying up because that's, that's reasonably not, affordable, you know. Not, yeah. But it's, it's what does that buy, you right, know. Right, right. So can you join me in thanking Peter Laharn for <laughs> his hour with us? Going to be, Peter has to run out to a meeting that we set up, so we're the ones to blame, but do take a couple minutes with him.